I want to thank uh, Chief Cox and uh, just the, the police, the Borough Police Department and the Fire Department for uh, opening up their, their home to us. And uh, they've been extremely good at um, just working with us and giving us the space and, and the time and um, inviting people and making sure that, that that invitation went out far and wide. Um, I'll give a quick introduction to myself and kind of talk about um, how our worlds converged um, and, and why we're here today. Uh, so back in 2011, um, my mom, who's sitting in the second row here, and myself were inside of this building making a police report on, on my father. Um, and uh, there, there was a victim who had come forward and disclosed to me uh, that she had been sexually abused as a child by my father. Uh, so mom and I made that, made that report, and um, he's currently serving a, a 30 to 60 year sentence uh, after his confession to, to dozens of victims. Um, what haunted me more than anything else was the fact that all of us missed it. Um, not a single person within our family, within the community, or anywhere else uh, was ever on to my dad. We never, we never uh, suspected that he was abusing no. kids. And so this went on for over 40 years. He, was, he successfully abused dozens and dozens of children. Um, that's commonplace for pedophiles. All of you guys that work with, uh, with victims, you understand um, there are always multiple victims um, whenever there's perpetration. And what I started to discover was it, it's not just that they abuse children and they're, they're deceptive and manipulative, but that much of the abuse that happens is right directly in front of us. I mean, literally in front of us. Um, and so I, I'm going to read an excerpt from a letter that my dad wrote from prison uh, back in 2013. And this was kind of my aha moment uh, that led me into, uh, into their research. And I will introduce you guys in just a second. Um, the letter says this, while on the subject, let me share a couple of pedophile moves with you that uh, parents need to know. Watch out for sleight of hand tricks. It's so easy for the abuser to be engaged in play or even conversation with your child and to place a hand too long on a child's butt and or crotch. A seemingly harmless horseback ride can lead into other things in private or seclusion. For example, the parent sees an innocent action like horseback play with hands supporting and keeping their child safe on the child's butt. But when out of sight, with simply reversing directions in the room, with the parents uh, or going down a hall or wherever, the hands quickly change slightly in position and now the genitals are being touched outside the clothing which the child seems okay. After all, her parents are close at hand and are okay with it all. And even at first, if the child seems uncomfortable, it does tickle or feel good. Repeated several times now, it's very easy to transition in private moments to under the clothing touches. That alone is enough for a pedophile to be arrested, yet almost impossible to prove, as one, the parents don't really think it happened with a trusted individual, and they don't want to falsely accuse or break up a friendship, a relationship. Two, the child is not aware that something really bad happened, but would be very unlikely to mention it to the parents. And three, if it all comes out, how would you prove any of this? So nothing happens except the pedophile is now emboldened to explore more brazen abuses and win the acceptance, trust, and secrecy of the child. The parents are becoming convinced that this perp and their child are a fun and safe match to be trusted together. Not good. So I, uh, I want to read... This is an article that just was published literally two days ago. And I don't know how many of you followed US Olympic doctor Larry Nasser, the sentence back in January. Um, if you noticed, did, it, did anybody watch the victim impact statements? At least some of them. If you noticed, victim after victim after victim after victim said, my mom was right here in the room. Both of my parents were in the room while he was digitally penetrating me. They were sitting just feet away. Victim after victim said it. Uh, Rachel Denhollander, who was uh, the first victim to come forward publicly, she said this, just this literally published two days ago. 
This article says, Dan Holler has told them as a teenager in 2000, Nasser repeatedly digitally penetrated her during multiple appointments. Both she and her mother noticed Nasser had a visible erection at two of those visits. For years, Den Hollander said she'd been studying public floor manipulation to confirm her suspicions that what Nasser had done to her wasn't medical. She reviewed Nasser's training videos and PowerPoints with the MSU investigators, pointing out where Nasser would have the same placement during her appointments with them, so that her mother would have been able to see the external massage, but not that Nasser's other hand was under the towel, penetrating her vagina and or rectum, the report says. So I, I, I want you to understand the gravity of this. So this is highly calculated. This is very methodical. Um, this is very intentional. And he's doing it in front of the parents. And so he's allowing the parents to see the one hand while the other hand is digitally penetrating the child, uh, Rachel in this instance, um, both vaginally and, rec uh, and in her rectum. As he's talking to mom, having casual conversation with her. And this isn't uh, uncommon. Uh, Dr. Jean Abel, one of the leading uh, experts in the field of pedophilia, estimates that for every single time somebody creates a hands-on victim, there's less than a 3% chance of them getting caught. What fascinates me as the son of a pedophile and as a researcher in this field is that much of this abuse literally happens this, this far away. And I'm not talking light petting abuse. This is intense abuse that happens this far away. So when I read that letter that I, that I just read you from my father, I had this, this big aha moment, and I ran across uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Magnick and his, his wife, Susanna Martinez-Conde, uh, both neuroscientists, uh, Harvard grads, so it gives them some credibility. They know what they're doing in their field. They specialize in deception and illusions and the science behind how our brains uh, miscalculate and, and see things that aren't there or, or fail to see things that are there. Um, and so I read their book, Slights of Mind, you'll have to help me with your subtitle, how the neuroscience of, what the neuroscience of magic reveals about our everyday deceptions. That book absolutely blew my mind. If you've not read that book, run and get it. All the pieces to the puzzle started coming together and I started realizing None of the research in the field of pedophilia talks about technique. We've all heard the red flag behavior stuff, right? Dirty little secret, it doesn't work. Trying to find red flag behavior, I can guarantee you as a son of a pedophile, as a researcher in this field, by the time you see any of the quote unquote red flag behavior, that victim has been abused for a long time. If you're even lucky enough to see any of the red flag behavior. So I started uh, really researching and, and, and just fascinated with their research um, on, on how magicians use these techniques to, to keep us blind. And as I was reading their research, and I'm, I'm reading letters from my father and asking him very specific questions after I read their research, I started realizing there's a, there's a very clear pattern here. This isn't about behavior. It's about developing technique. It's about developing skills. Uh, I actually reject the term grooming behavior and I, I, I came up with the term um, testing because it's what they're doing. They're testing the child, they're testing the adults, they're testing themselves. And it all becomes a game to them. And as my dad said in the letter, they become emboldened to, to just learn more. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over and let you guys introduce yourselves and, and your research. And um, we literally just met in person for the first time about, an, what, an hour and a half ago? So thank you guys so much for coming to Somerset and, and helping us uh, understand deception. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for oh, Can, can yes, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Jose, for the, for the opportunity for, for reaching out to us. Uh, our minds were similarly blown by um, uh, first receiving uh, Jimmy's uh, email and reading uh, his uh, blog post about this, uh, this topic and just uh, seeing from our end how the research that we have done has uh, such an important application 
in an area that we have never thought about, and it, it made so much sense. And so we have been in, a, we just met in person, but uh, we have been communicating now for, for a while and uh, seeing possible uh, ways of uh, collaboration and that uh, uh, overlap, and that's uh, why we're here. And that uh, uh, we're not uh, experts on the, on the matter of uh, abuse. Uh, we're envisioning um, our presentations today as, uh, as uh, being largely a discussion, a conversation. We would like to tell you about the research that we have done, what it tells us about perception, about misdirection, and that uh, and we can uh, draw some uh, implications and do our best to answer your questions about the brain mechanisms behind deception and, and misdirection. And you should feel free to, uh, to interrupt and just stop us and ask us to clarify things throughout. We have two presentations, uh, I guess with a, with a break in between. So one of the presentations is about illusions in general, misperception, and that's, uh, that's the first of them. And, that, uh, and we'll have a discussion and then we'll have the break and after the break we'll come back for another presentation. Uh, this one more directly related to what we call cognitive illusions, such as illusions having to do with attention, uh, how, what we see and fail to see depending on what we're being draw, drawn to pay attention to. Also importantly, the things that we remember and how we remember them, which may or may not match exactly what happened. So, so anyway, so we're going to do this in a, as a bit of a tag team uh, effort, and uh, and let's start by talking about illusion. I've mentioned the, uh, the the word illusion a couple of times, and I'm going to define it uh, to start off very simply as a perception that doesn't match reality. So when we experience, say, a visual illusion, we may see something that is not there, or fail to see something that is there, or more generally, just see something different from what is there. And illusions apply not just to vision, but uh, they affect all our senses, they affect our cognition, the way that we think about things. But uh, we find that uh, our original training was uh, as vision scientists, and from there we moved into cognition and attention. And we still find it very useful to think about visual illusions as a tool to understand perception in general. So let me, in the, yeah, so, so we, we actually uh, have an illusion contest that we organize every year, and that, uh, that has led to our most recent book that we just published, uh, Champions of Illusion. And uh, you can, if you're interested in illusions in general, you can, you can actually go online and search, uh, just, just Google illusionoftheyear.com altogether, illusionoftheyear.com, and there you can see the, um, a, an archive of the illusions that uh, have been the top uh, rated ones in the last that uh, we've been doing now this contest for 13 years. So, all right, so let me just start with, uh, with an illusion to illustrate what, uh, what this is about. All right. So what I'd like you to do here is to keep your eyes on the central cross, but pay attention to the faces to the sides. So while keeping your eyes on the cross. And you should see that these faces of uh, beautiful people in just a few seconds should become very distorted, very grotesque. This is not a Photoshop trick. These are the same beautiful Hollywood people you all know and love. And, uh, but look at the faces directly now. You will see that they're completely unmodified. The distortion is happening just in your brain. Look back at the central cross while paying attention to the faces. And you see again that they become very distorted, very strange looking. This is, this is happening in your brain, as I said. And this, why, what does this illusion happen? What does, this tell, what does it tell us about brain mechanisms? Well, for one, something important that it tells us is that for the brain, we don't have absolute things. And uh, this applies to perception, it applies to cognition. 
Uh, we don't consider something is black or white in isolation. Everything depends on what you compare it to. Everything depends on the context. And so, what in this particular illusion, what is happening is that you have a number of faces, one after the other, presented in quick succession. And what your brain is doing is performing a very quick online comparison for each of these faces' features with the face that came before. So say, if we see a face that has a very small nose, and then immediately we see a face that has an average size nose, we're going to perceive the second face as having a very large nose because we're comparing it immediately and implicitly with the face that came before. And this is happening automatically and we don't necessarily realize that there's a subjective element to it. This is an automatic comp computation our brains are constantly doing. Okay, so let's look at another type of illusion here. So here you have two circles, one there and one there, and they're the same size, and this one might look a little bigger. If we change the surround here, but we move this circle out, that circle doesn't really change size. Here, you can see the circle's a little bigger, uh, the, and now it's smaller. And so as we change the outside, you can see that circle feels like it changes size a little bit. But this gets to be really powerful for some reason, which we don't know, but when we put it in the surround. So if you look at this yellow dot as, it, as this whole thing moves, you can see this dot in the center really changes size greatly, right? That's not happening. That's just in your brain. The middle circle is saying the same size. Okay, so another type of illusion would be, for example, these 16 door panels. So you see these, this, they look like wooden door coffers, right? You see those, how many rectangles do you see there? See them? See 16 or so? How, how many circles do you see? Anybody see circles? So if I show you this now, it might happen that you can see the circles now. So it turns out that all of the horizontal lines, there are no rectangles at all, all of the horizontal lines are in fact in the shape of circles. So if I just take away those yellow circles, now you can see that there are 16 yellow circle, or 16 horizontal lines sets that make up circles and then against a background of vertical lines, okay? So whereas before, you may have had a hard time seeing any circles there at all, once you know what to pay attention to, you can pick out this against the background and see that these circles exist. So your expectations of what you can find matter a lot to what you can possibly see. And this may be critical to the topic at hand, right? So your expectations affect how it is you see. And I'm not talking about, you know, behavior that's aberrant. I'm talking about seeing horizontal versus vertical lines. I'm talking about seeing circles versus squares. I'm talking about the fundamental basis of how we see anything is affected by how you expect to see. Okay? So let's, let's continue to push along this a little more. So you see here, this is a famous illusion called the cafe wall illusion that Richard Gregory first described. And you see these lines in the masonry are actually tilted, right? So you can see that as these bricks are laid, that, that, that these, two, these two sets of lines converge this way and that set of lines converges that way, right? Well, you can imagine this must have driven the mason crazy when he laid these tiles, because these tiles are not crooked, and they're, they're, they're exactly rectangle. And those lines are exactly straight and parallel with respect to each other. The reason they look tilted is actually because of your brains. It's because of the way your brain is presenting this to you, okay? So there's a more modern version of this that just won second prize in our contest this year um, by, by Victoria Skye. And you can see these blue lines here look like they're tilted with respect to each other, right? Okay? But they're not. They're perfectly horizontal. And I'm gonna, I, know, I know some of you are thinking, no, they're actually tilted and that I'm kind of exaggerating. They're exactly horizontal. And I'm going to prove it to you now, because if, if it's true, we should be able to make it seem that way. Because it must be that, that these white and black lines are vertical, these blue lines are horizontal, and they only look crooked because of the way these diamonds interact at the corners here. Now, 
Why those diamonds would interact that way, we don't know. Not yet. We're studying. That's the kind of thing that vision scientists study, how this could possibly happen. It probably has something to do with the way that, if you look, look over here in the corner of the room, the way that these lines meet each other and meet the floor gives us information about the shape of the room from where we're sitting. Okay? And I'll talk to you about that a little bit more, that we can't know how anything's shaped in the world except by the light that falls in our retina. And that's highly ambiguous, so we have to figure it out from what we're seeing which is why expectation matters so much. Well here, these diamonds, the way that they're shaped and colored may actually confuse the way that we see how lines meet and therefore confuse our brains as to their very shape. If that's the case, if I blur this image and make these diamond shapes disappear, they should look horizontal again, right? Let's try it. So if we now take these images and blur them, you can see it's still crooked, but it's going to start to become horizontal now. Once you can't see the diamonds, you can see that those blue lines are exactly horizontal. Exactly horizontal in your brains, right? It's exactly the same image blurred. Okay? So I made the image worse, and it got more accurate in your brains. Isn't that just what happened to you right now? Okay, so let's move on a little further. So an example, again, of how everything is relative and how we perceive things depends on uh, the context is this illusion. So here we have white chess uh, pieces and black chess pieces, right? And that's very important to the game because the white player traditionally, in the, in the, in the way that, that I learned it, typically the, 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 the white pieces go first. Right? So there's an advantage there in this particular case. The problem with this is that these pieces are exactly the same. Okay? And I don't mean that they're both kind of grayish. I mean like pixel by pixel, these pieces are identical if you compare the pixels this way. And it's hard to see here, but it has to do with the way the context of their setting by which this looks different. It's a similar thing to how we saw the faces, but now in the context of brightness. So to prove it to you, if I just take away the background, you can see that these pieces are actually exactly identical pixel for pixel, okay? Now again, if I put the background back, the top looks white and the bottom looks black, but there, again, I haven't changed the pieces at all. It's just the background. Now, another case. This is the leaning tower illusion, okay? So if you have these two towers, the one on the right leans more to the right, correct? Everybody see that? No, you don't. They're physically identical, okay? It only looks more to the right in your brain. If we, put, if we cut and paste these over, you can see pixel by pixel, they're exactly identical. If, if we now move this back over, it doesn't matter. You, even, you know they're identical, but this one looks like it's leaning more to the right, right? It doesn't matter what you, what you know. What matters is how your brain processes this. So it, what, why would this happen? Must be the question happening in your head. Why would this happen? Well, let's think about how this occurs. The way that we see now is the process of, is an evolutionary process in which our brains had to figure out the patterns of light that fall on our retinas how to interpret those things in the world. So for example, I know this gentleman with the tie in the front here, it's not that he's huge and sitting in the back, okay? It's that he looks larger than the people in the back on my retina because he's closer to me, right? So by perspective, he would subtend more of an angle on my retina <coughs> than someone sitting in the back. But even someone in the back who might be larger than he is, okay? There's other clues that he's in front of people in the back. For example, he occludes the people in the back. That's a, a clue that he's in front, okay? Now, I also have two eyes, so I can compare the images between my two eyes and figure out that he's in, he's in front versus people in the back because of the way the two images on my two eyes interact. That's called stereoscopy, okay? So there's various types of clues by which the brain figures out how things have relationship to each other in the brain based on what's on the retina. Well, let's think about what you're looking at here. If you were, for example, looking at two lines that went off into infinity like train tracks in your visual field, 
they would actually, as they go off into the distance, they get closer and closer to get closer until they look like they touched at the horizon, right? Now, these two buildings are parallel, right? They must be because they're identical images, but they don't converge, right? Even though you can tell that they lean off into the distance, your brain can see that they don't converge. And because they don't converge, the brain thinks, aha, because they're not converging in the distance, it must be that they're in real life diverging. So your brain is imposing on you the idea that these buildings separate from each other as they go off, that they're leaning away from each other. Because if they weren't, if they were really parallel buildings, like the buildings in Kuala Lumpur, or the Twin Towers in New York, while well, they still stood, if you stood at the bottom of those and looked up, they would actually look like they begin to touch at the top end of them compared to where you were standing at the bottom. Okay? So your brain is using the clues of the statistics in the images to figure out the relationship between things, in this case, incorrectly. Okay? So another example is this. These two roads are parallel. I'm sorry, I got confused. It's these two roads are parallel. And then when you... And the, uh, these two roads are... Oh, oh, geez. What is going on? <coughs> Which two roads are parallel? Which one is it? Two on the, the one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left and the one on the right overlap perfectly. They're congruent. And these two look like they're match, but in fact they don't. Okay? So they looked like they matched, but in fact they aren't because your brain in that particular case saw them as two identical roads going off into the distance in the highway and converging, right? That's how they should look if it's a three-dimensional image on your eye of two roads that are exactly identical going off into the distance. But in fact, those two things are not based on how it susses out the way that information relates to each other. And it gets worse from here, okay? That's how illusions happen because it's all a guesstimate by your brain anyway, okay? That's the only thing you could have ever seen. It's not that the real world isn't out there and that things are weird, okay? The real world is out there, but you've never lived there. You've only lived inside your brain and seen this representation of the world that's built up by these illusory processes, okay? So, this is critical to understanding deception and misperception and the topic of the day, okay? How these things can happen to people who are paying attention. Now, here's another example of how perspective can fool you, okay? So here we have some slopes, okay? Now I'm gonna, just to prove that these aren't magnets rolling a pill, okay? They're just regular balls. They're making them out of wooden and cork here. That's what Kukichi Suchihara won the contest with a few years ago. Now, who here thinks balls roll uphill against gravity? <coughs> None of you? Are those balls rolling uphill against gravity or not? No. In fact, there's no uphill, okay? That these were rolling downhill, okay? So now you know how it works, right? You've seen it, you know exactly how this is laid out. There's no question in your mind what was just happening. You saw it from a special perspective that made it look like it was rolling uphill, right? So now that you know, you just won't see it that way, right? So let's just put it back. Those balls are still rolling uphill, right? You're not seeing them rolling downhill. How's that possible? You know what's going on here. You look at this and you say, those balls are still rolling uphill, even though you know how this works out. This is how you can have the same misperception over and over and over again. Your visual system uses rules to assemble your universe around you based on these clues in your eyes and those rules are so powerful, they overcome your cognitive awareness that gravity makes things go down and not up. That's how fundamental they are, okay? They drive everything that you see and think. All right, so let's move on a little further. <coughs> Here we have a cognitive illusion. Now, this sprinkled rainbow donut, okay, uh, is, is basically twinkling now, and then when it rotates back and forth, you see the twinkling stops, and the uh, it's just a it's just a turning donut. Now, I lied a little bit just then. 
the twinkling never stops. If you look at this dot right here, while it turns, you can see it's twinkling from one color to another. If you keep your eye on that and don't move it, you can see that the color is still changing, even when it rotates. But if you look back into the center again, and keep your eye there, while you pay attention to the donut as a whole, while it rotates, the twinkling stops. And what this suggests is that the visual system, the way it pays attention to things, it gives primacy to motion, okay? So you can pay attention to the motion of the donut, but that suppresses the other types of changes that are going on at the time. So to put it another way, the way your attentional system works, when you pay attention to something, it means you're suppressing everything else and that certain types of information to your visual system are more important than others, the way you're paying attention. I, I want to I wanna say something about uh, this particular topic and this particular illusion uh, that it just occurs to me. Um, so magicians, we will talk more about magicians after the break, but magicians have a saying that uh, 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 a large motion covers a small motion and I think that that's very related both to this illusion and what to Jimmy was mentioning um, a, earlier, earlier on about um, this uh, victim statement and uh, the hand positioning and how one hand was doing one thing and another hand was doing something else more covertly. And this is something that magicians would do that uh, use a big motion with one hand to draw attention, to do something obvious, and the other hand is the hand that is holding on to the coin or whatever it is that they want to keep hidden. And so in this, this illusion, we have a big motion that is making us blind to a small motion that is also happening there and that we could perceive if we were made aware that that small motion is still happening. So, again, your attentional system has a priority to it about what you can and can't see. Your expectations feed into this. You can be led down the garden path to pay attention to the wrong thing. That's a magician's job. It's also what <coughs> sex abusers are doing. Okay? That's critical to know. Now, color also plays a role in this. You can't see the colors on this very well because it's against a brown screen, but you can see Van Gogh here and you can see Rembrandt, right? And the picture, it's, it's their, a couple of their famous self-portraits. Now, they don't look strange, do they? They look strange to you? No? Okay. Well, they are very strange, and I'll show you why. If we, if we just move the black and white portion of those images away from, from the color portions, you'll notice the black and white portions are different. But in fact, that the, the, the authors of the creators of this illusion, Bergier and, and, and colleagues, they actually had mixed the colors from the two images, okay? So what that means is they took the colors from the Van Gogh image and they took the colors from the Rembrandt image in Photoshop and mixed them. And then they put that one mixed color image in, back into both and the colors assigned themselves to the luminance profiles uh, however they were needed to be seen, okay? So what this suggests is that you see the shape of things based on the luminance, black and white profiles of things. And then the colors are assigned to be whatever is appropriate to see those in the right shape, okay? So again, it gives kind of a priority to color versus luminance. So you can see that these general concepts in vision, something as orthogonal as color versus brightness, have a primacy and a priority in the way the visual system works. So. If we swap them, it doesn't matter, okay? It still gets assigned the same way. And it doesn't matter that it's just these, these two images or art in general. If you look at a bucolic scene here compared to the New York skyline, it's exactly the same. They have exactly the same colors mixed together, but different luminance profiles. Now, if I just put them back, you can still see that if we swap them, it doesn't matter, okay? The colors assign themselves appropriately to whatever it is you need to see for the luminance profile. So your brain is just taking the clues from the luminance about what the shape should be and assigning the colors to be appropriate as you need them okay, on the fly. And you've been doing this your whole life. These aren't standalone things that are just happening here. You're doing that everywhere. It's why a bleeding 
watercolor image looks right, it still looks okay, right? Even though the colors may bleed across the edges, it doesn't matter. Your visual system is fine with it, okay? So um, I'm gonna sit, give it back to Susanna now. We'll talk a little bit about deception. So we've shown you a, a number of examples of uh, various kinds of illusions and that uh, what we're getting at is the general principle. So we have all of these cases where perception doesn't match reality. Uh, you may be wondering why does this happen? Why, how come our brains are indicating they're, they're, they're misleading us? Why are we perceiving illusions rather than the truth? And um, and uh, well, this is an area of active research in, in neuroscience. But fundamentally, uh, one main reason is that our brains are naturally limited. Even though the brain is the most complex organ in the body, it still has a certain size. It has to fit inside of a head. It uh, will have a limited number of brain areas, of, uh, of connections between areas. We have a limited number of neurons. And so we are literally unable to grasp and to process the huge amount of sensory information that surrounds us. So our brains end up picking and choosing and just sampling a very small portion of reality and guesstimating uh, everything else. So even though we uh, believe there's some reality out there, the fact is that we have never lived in this reality. All that we have ever interacted with is our brain's simulation of this reality based on very partial actual information. And some of the mechanisms by which our brains construct this grand simulation are filling in blanks, both perceptual and cognitive, uh, seeking structure, trying to make sense of things, uh, talk more about this, and improving narratives. What I mean by this is uh, making up stories, we're constantly trying to make sense of the world, our brains are meaning-seeking machines. We connect cause and effect, but we don't always do it well or appropriately. And so we generate some narratives about uh, people's, other people's actions, about our own actions, that may or may not be correct. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, filling in blanks. So the, the most, uh, maybe Steve can demonstrate what I'm holding, the microphone, but the, the most famous uh, gap that we have in our visual system is our, our blind spot. This is where our optic nerves leave our retina to carry visual information from the eye to the to the rest of the brain. And so, if you uh, stretch both arms, so do, do what Steve is doing, not what the cartoon. The cartoon is not doing it properly. You need to have both elbows com completely straight. And that uh, yes, your, your fingers are looking good. So connect connect both both thumbs. Uh, or just just the fingers. The, the index fingers should be your pointer fingers should be sticking out. Very good. And that uh, so now uh, say close your uh, left eye and yes, close your left eye and look at your left finger fingertip while paying attention to your right fingertip. And you should see that the right fingertip disappears. If it doesn't, just uh, switch your, uh, wiggle your, your thumbs, uh, your, your index fingers a bit and you, you should be able to make it go away. It's important that you keep both elbows completely straight in front of you or you won't have the right distance. Uh, for those of you who have seen the fingertip disappear, do, do, do it again. Uh, make, it, make it disappear again if you can. And now, once the fingertip is gone, uh, can you tell me, can you see what's behind it? Can, can people say, yeah, any, any of you can see what's behind the finger? Yeah, I see some people nodding. The fact is that you can't. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint, but uh, nobody has x-ray vision. What's, uh, what's happening instead is that your brain is using the information, the visual information about the visual field that is surrounding this actual hole in your vision and is using this information to guess what must be going on in this blind area of your visual field. 
and is using the textures, the colors, the general shapes to fill in this perceptual gap. So it's a very smart algorithm, but it's not smart enough to actually reconstruct the fingertip. But I was, what's remarkable here is that we are now, you might, you, you, you might be thinking, we don't have photoreceptors in this part of our retinas. We just have, this is where the wire leaves the eye to connect to the brain. We should be seeing a big hole in that area, and, uh, and, or, or a big black thing. And that is not what happens. Instead, our brain is filling it in, so not only we are seeing something that is not there, but we are completely unaware of our actual lack of vision in that area. So there's a perceptual failure, but there's also a cognitive failure, because uh, we don't know that there's anything wrong. When, when in fact it's all made up. Um, this is another example of how we can construct very complex percepts with very little factual information. So here we have three gray rectangles, the different shades of gray. Um, I can change the angle between them and uh, it, it looks like it starts to have some sort of structure to it, but uh, there's not much to be seen so far. Now, if I guess at three Batman, immediately it looks like a triangle that is not actually there. This is a variation of a famous illusion. But there is no, there is no actual triangle. There's just these three Batman, these patches of gray. But see what happens if we now, again, change the angle. Now the triangle becomes a pyramid that is still not there and goes back to a triangle. So we have a very complex representation that changes even volume, we go from 2D to 3D and back to 2D based on very sparse visual cues. So these are some of the ways in which we fill in blanks. How do we seek structure? Uh, as I mentioned, our brains are constantly trying to make sense of things and that, uh, that's, that's, that's generally a good strategy. The problem is that we also try to make sense of things that intrinsically are chaotic or disorganized, so we, we see faces in the clouds, so to speak. And here we have uh, an example of how we do that. This is um, a grid that is only organized right in the center, and the left and right flank are completely disorganized or very chaotic. Now I'm gonna ask you to fix your gaze, just choose one of these intersections in the center, fix your gaze there very carefully, and keep your eyes there, and in just a few seconds, you will see that both the right and the left flank become completely organized. So the whole grid is not perfectly regular, but what's happening instead is it's all in your brains. Your brains are taking the central structure and they're imposing it on the left and right flanks. So you're seeing order where there is chaos. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we improve narratives, how we come up with stories that we tell ourselves, to uh, help us again make sense of the world and how, how these stories can be dead wrong. Um, so I want to talk about an experiment that uh, this group in Sweden conducted now uh, 12 years ago. It, they called it, they called this uh, concept, this new concept back then, choice blindness. Indicates that uh, we're blind to the results of our choices. And what they did was something quite clever. So they, they designed an, exper an experiment in the lab in which they had people come and they would show them pictures of faces and they had to choose of uh, any two pictures which one is most attractive. So subjects would point to whatever picture they liked best and then the researchers would turn the photos upside down and ask the subject to pick up the photo that they just chose what the subjects didn't know is that these researchers have been trained by a professional magician to conduct sleight of hand. So when the subjects pick the photo that they thought they had just chosen, they end up with the opposite photo. Now, about a third of the times, the experimental participants did not realize that a swap had taken place. And, uh, but, so that's already remarkable, but it wasn't even the most interesting thing about this experiment, the most interesting thing happened when now, after the subjects picked up, picked the, the, the wrong photo, they didn't realize there has been a swap. But now the researchers asked, can you tell me why you chose that photo in particular? What made it more attractive to you than the other photo? 
And you might think, well, this is not the photo that they chose. They chose the opposite photo. So people might be at a complete loss for an explanation because this is not their choice. But in fact, subjects came up with all sorts of reasons to justify choices that they didn't actually make. And these are some examples of the justifications that people came up with. She's radiant. I would rather have approached her at a bar than the other one. I like earrings. In fact, the one that he actually chose had no earrings. So this is all post hoc, this is all after the fact. She looks like an aunt of mine, I think, and she seems nicer than the other one. So very, very complex explanations. Yes, well, she looks very hot in this picture, but maybe not so complex explanations. <laughs> Just a nice shape of the face and the chin. I thought she had more personality in a way, she was the most appealing to me. All sorts of reasons, I don't know. That's the first honest subject. So, so there's, there's really a lot of justifications that are provided to justify a behavior that is completely illusory, right? And, 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 uh, and I think that this is also uh, quite important, uh, well, in a number of ways. Uh, first off, about how we understand our own behavior. We're used to try and figure out, figure, figure out other people's motives and that uh, we come up with um, potential reasons why people act the way they do. But we do the same thing with ourselves. We consider our own actions as we would anybody else's and then come up with reasons. So oftentimes we don't think and then we act. We act and then we think of, okay, if I did this, it must have been because this and that. And we, we always have a, a good reason for it. So, so I, I think that this is uh, very interesting, uh, just uh, generally about human behavior, but, uh, but also in, in the context that we are talking today, about uh, sexual abuse and, that, uh, and uh, in a pedophile uh, situation, how the narratives that parents, that caretakers may end up telling ourselves and, and really believing these stories may be quite different uh, from what's going on in reality. Um. All right, so yes, so this is our, our book about the contest, the contest, and we, we do have a bonus illusion before we start q and I guess. All right, bonus illusion, the dress. You guys have seen this before. Anybody here not seen this before? Okay, so I want you to, um, to raise your hand if you see this dress as white and gold. Only, so who here hasn't seen this illusion before? Raise your hand. So just a few of you. Can you raise your hand if you've seen this before? Okay. That explains why only a few of you said it was white and gold, because you know that it's white, blue, and black. In fact, uh, when people don't know what dress color this is, half of them say it's white and gold, okay? And half of them say it's blue and black. And then mysteriously, once they know it's blue and black, they almost all say it's blue and black, okay? So here's how it works. So we have this dress, and the question is, why is it that half of humanity sees this as blue and uh, white and gold, and half of it sees it as blue and black? That's the question. And here's a clue to the answer. So imagine you have a black and blue dress, and you put sunlight on it. It would have this color under the sunlight. If you had a white and gold dress, and you put it in the shade, it would have this color on it. This color here, and this color here are physically identical, okay? But you can see how they look different depending on the context that they're set in, right? If you see it as being part of a white and gold dress, you see it this color. And if you see it as being part of a black and blue dress, you see it as this color. So the difference here is that half of the people seem to be seeing it under one color of light, and half of the people see, seem to be seeing it under the other color of light. I'll let Susanna, so you want to you continue this? Or you, you want yes. To, yeah. so, so something that is, um, that uh, I, I, I am one of the people who sees it as a white and gold, try, try as I might, can see it any other way. Um, 
And uh, what this is uh, interesting is not only about uh, what this uh, illusion tells us about color processing, but just in general about the way that illusions come about and why we experience illusions. Because uh, um, uh, oftentimes illusions are thought of as errors of perception, but the fact is that they are intrinsic to our, uh, and sometimes uh, they, they, they do, they do uh, result in errors, but, uh, but the point is that except, uh, illusions are not the exceptions, they are the rule of our perception. That's why they're basically, a lot of them are almost impossible or completely impossible to overcome because it is the very fabric of our perceptual machine that, that rests on, on illusions. And that in, term, in terms of, uh, and this um, uh, also has an evolutionary explanation, which I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. So in the case of the dress, so the dress, as Steve pointed out, in reality, so to speak, or uh, if we illuminate the dress unambiguously with white lighting, the dress would appear to everybody as black and blue. However, with the famous picture of the dress that went viral, the ambiguity came about because the source of illumination of the dress was a, a hybrid sort of source of lighting that contained both blue and gold. And under these specific conditions of this color, uh, this lighting color mix, the dress looks white and gold to some people and blue and black to other people. But so it was critical that the lighting was mixed, that it was the, an ambiguous lighting, but it, it had to do specifically with these two colors. It couldn't have been just any two colors that got mixed. It was these two colors in particular because blue and gold are the colors under which our color perception evolved over eons. The blue from the sky and the gold from the sun. And so vision scientists as a community, we still don't know why some people see the dress as white and gold and other people see the dress as black and blue, but what we have been able to determine so far, based on the evidence we have, is that those people who perceive the dress as white and gold, their visual systems are telling them that the dress is in the shade, whereas those people that see the dress as blue and black, their visual systems are telling them that the dress is under direct sunlight. So that's just an example of how these illusions, they're, they're with us, they're part of us, they're here to stay, that's, uh, they're, they're completely pervasive, and that's the way that our uh, visual systems and our neural systems have evolved. Illusions pose a lot of advantages to us. They allow us to, uh, these are perceptual shortcuts in general, that allow us to navigate our environment in a fast and efficient manner for the most part. They allow us to react quickly. Uh, if we have some big animal coming at us, we don't care much if we misperceive it and we thought it was a tiger when it's in fact a lion. We just want to get out of there as fast as possible. But at the same time, there are specific scenarios in which uh, illusions and misperceptions can be very problematic, as you all know. And I think we can open the Q&A. Can I, can I share something, um, Stephen? Because this is just uh, fascinating to me. Uh, um, all of it's fascinating. But um, as you were showing some of these, some of these illusions in these demonstrations, um, I recalled a conversation that I had it was shortly after I had read uh, your your book, Slights of Mind, and I started explaining this concept to the first person for the very first time, who happened to be the father of the victims who. Uh, my dad was charged on. And so as I was describing this, his face just went pale. And he said, you know what? He said, I actually walked in on your dad abusing my daughters. And he said, and I'm talking full on abusing my daughters. And he said, within a second, he had, he had his clothing put back on. And he said, within 30 seconds uh, of me questioning what I had just seen, he had me convinced not only that I didn't see it, but he said, I went home feeling like crap because I questioned 
your, your dad. And so as you showed the, the different faces, it was that sleight of hand and rewriting the script. There's so many techniques that are being used he never expected to see his daughter being abused when he walked into that room. My dad, with door wide open, right in plain sight, knowing that, that these girls' father was, was literally just feet away from him, was sexually assaulting his daughters. He walks into the room, didn't phase my dad one bit. See, we, we think that uh, we're going to walk into the room, and, and what I hear when I consult with churches a lot is, well, if there was something going on, I, I would know about it. I would be able to see it. Wrong answer. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, and that, and that, I, that's a very uh, interesting point that you're making about it because there's, there's an issue, um, and we see this all the time when we analyze um, magic shows because there are different levels of, uh, of deception and of misdirection. So you, uh, there's the fact that you may not see something, but even if you see something, the recall that comes later that uh, that's a critical element. That I'm going to be, be talking about uh, magicians now. But uh, for a magician, you can, you can think about um, that a magician well, doesn't want you to know what the method is during the show. But, uh, but uh, the magi it's also important for the success of the magician that the spectators, it, it may be that even though they didn't actually realize what was happening during the show, they later on, they may be home and thinking, ah, so that happened and that happened, so it must be that this is what the magician did. So magicians want to prevent that possibility that spectators are going to be able to reconstruct what happened later on in their own time. So what they do is that they provide misinformation, verbal misinformation, as part of the magic show. And if you have ever been to, to a magic show, that uh, it's, it's very common that at some point the magician will describe what just happened. So the magician may bring a volunteer on the stage and they will have them choose a card and uh, do a number of things. And the magician then will just recast everything that happened. We say, okay, so you, you came up to the stage, we never know each other, and that uh, you chose a car, you, you did this and that, and it won't be exactly the truth, there will be a difference. It, will, it won't be a huge difference that would uh, provide a big red flag, but, uh, but it will be a difference that will make, for example, think, uh, the audience uh, think later on that the magician was never holding the cards, that the cards were on the subject hand, instead of the magician actually having physical control of the cards. And so when the audience then tries to reconstruct what happened in the stage, it's not just, it's like trying to put together this puzzle, and not only are you missing some of the pieces, but you have some of the incorrect pieces as well. Yeah, I also studied, because um, you just fascinated me that Literally within 30 seconds, uh, not only was he convinced that he didn't see what he knew he saw, but that script was rewritten, but but all but still were her, his memories. And so I started studying this this concept of memory rewriting, and it's absolutely incredible uh, how quickly our memories can be rewritten. And mm -hmm. they've done, I mean, a lot of studies on this, and, and I assume magicians use use that technique of memory rewriting. Uh, but it's a fascinating concept. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about magic is you to choose a card out of any card and hold it in your mind, right? And that uh, I then did this and that and this and that and then I just guessed your card, right? The only explanation can be magic. Well, in the explanation they gave, you remember what I first said was you had to pick a card from the deck. But the, what he described it when he recapped the, the, the actual maneuver is he said, I asked you to choose a card out of the any two cards. So what he, what he recapped was that you had to think of a card, and what he actually did was that you had to pick a card that was arrayed. Those are two, thi two different things. If you have to pick one of 52 cards out of your mind, how could I know what that is, right? I have a one in two, 52 chance. But if what I actually did was hold out an array of cards to you that you had to choose, now I'm in control of the cards and I can force one on you. You may not know how I did that and I may have special sleights of hand techniques to do that, but I can force you, I, I assure you, to choose the card I want you to choose. And now I know which card it was. But then what I told you to remember was that you chose a card as if you guessed it out of your mind. 
And what happens is people actually remember the last thing that they were told or the last thing that they did that they were told to think in their head. And they're much more likely to then remember that they chose a card out of the air than that they picked it out of the deck. Okay? So now tomorrow when they're trying to figure out how did he do that trick, he, they, you remember it wrong. Okay? And we now know neuroscientifically that when you commit a short-term me memory to long-term memory, what actually happens is when you remember the long-term memory, when you remember, for example, um, the face of your grandmother serving Thanksgiving dinner when you were a child, okay? When you remember that memory coming out of, coming out of memory and you have it in short-term memory while you, while you actually process that information, you then put it back into long-term memory afterwards. It actually gets destroyed while you use it and then it goes back into your long-term memory and restored again. But now it's a little different. Each time you remember that information, it's a little different. We say in, in science, we'd say we added noise to that. And so there's a drift in that memory over time. And the more you think of it, the more it drifts. And that gives me, as the magician, the chance to put in the wrong information so that the long-term memory that you have is just purely wrong. So you could come back the next day and think, oh, what they did was this and this and this and this, when there was no step C at all, right? Or D was a different thing, right? So that's how they change memory. What's interesting to me is it's not just, it's not just long, it's permanently wrong. And so, you know, yeah. you use the term tries, I might. Tries, you might, to recall what really happened. You're not able to do it. Exactly. It can't and, happen. Uh, and, the, and I think that, uh, well, it, it reminds me, so often, oftentimes, uh, people come to us and they know that we work with magicians and they will say, oh, I, this time I went to this amazing magic show and the magician did this and that and, and how did he do it? And that I will always say, well, it's impossible to know because what you're recalling is almost certainly not what actually happened and what you actually saw at the time. This is a, a construction that you have now that may have very little to do with reality and I think that in the context of abuse, this uh, with uh, a exculpatory witness testimonies, like these caretakers may be completely convinced they were there, there was nothing inappropriate, and they would swear this is the way it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a way to get back to the original memory? You say it's distorted over time. Is there a way to get back to no, it's a. Uh, you may have elements of the original memory that are real. Whatever has been rewritten, you cannot access. But uh, you may realize after after the fact that a given more a context, more information, that a something that you had interpreted in a certain way, it, there's another possible explanation. So you can interpret, reinterpret past actions, but a memory that has been lost and rewritten, that's no longer accessible. There was a question in the, in the back. There was one in the back. Yeah. Um, you've been talking about this in terms of what parents or, or someone should, might be seeing. What about in terms of what the victim is experiencing? Does, is the perpetrator also changing what the victim experiences or how they what, what my experience has been is, um, I, I don't know of any other researcher in the field of pedophilia anywhere who's talking about this. Um, I, I, and so when I, when I go and I talk, talk at uh, different organizations, different churches, what have you, and, and I start talking about this concept of, you know, these guys are using very, these pedophiles are using very specific techniques, and it's complex. I mean, it's not... It's not like they just can't control themselves and, and they're, you know, they're grabbing little kids or whatever. Um, the complexity is unreal. And, and, and uh, you know, I think you guys have unpacked some of that. Uh, you're going to unpack a lot more. But in the child's mind, there is no capacity for them, for a you know, three, four, five, six-year-old child, to know that when mom is three feet away from me and I'm being digitally penetrated, um, Larry Nasser digitally penetrated victims for up to 42 minutes at a time with mom and sometimes mom and dad sitting literally right beside, right beside him. 
if there's no capacity in the child's brain to understand that mom and dad uh, are, are completely blind to this. In the child's mind, what they internalize is mom and dad are seeing this and they know. I mean, they experience it. They know it. They feel it. It doesn't feel right. It feels wrong. It feels bad. The child knows that. The child feels that. The child's completely physically paralyzed. While mom is having a casual conversation with the man who's doing it to them. And so in that child's mind, and, and I've seen survivors carry this into their 70s and 80s, um, where they still hold resentment that all these people are around watching this happen to me, not one person stepped in to help me. The reality is, those people literally didn't see it happening. And even if they did see it happening, they convinced themselves, or the narrative was rewritten for them, where they're convinced they didn't see it. We all feel that, um, uh, that, that we're perceptive. We all think that we're far more perceptive than we are. That gets us into trouble. It gets us into trouble when we, we write our policies. Churches now are doing the, the too deep policy. Put two adults in, in, in the room for accountability. Doesn't work. Um, write a policy that's going to that's gonna cause a, a perpetrator to opt out. Doesn't work. Increase background checks and, and let them know that we're taking child abuse seriously and that, and that we're creating a culture where we're going to keep an eye on them. Doesn't work. In fact, I would argue, this is theoretical, but I would argue that the more we increase our training, the more, in, uh, the more abuse actually increases um, because it's, it's challenge accepted. Um, it's the Apollo Robbins, you know, the pickpocket. Um, he picked clean Jimmy Carter's Secret Service agents. He's just casually talking to them, literally emptied their pockets, and, and the lead agent, um, when, when uh, Apollo Robbins pulled out the uh, itinerary, he said, um, sir, you're not authorized to see that. Apollo Robbins started handing back his badge, and then he says, oh, and you're forgetting one more thing, and he hands the keys to the motorcade. I mean, this, it's incredible. He literally picked their, and I love Apollo Robbins, and these guys have, have, have worked with Apollo and, um, pretty extensively, and it's just fascinating to me. Um, David, you had a question? Yeah, uh, on the illusion side of it, the one with the diamonds and the, the diagonal lines versus the blue and black and white gold dress. Why is it that on the dress, once I know, I can see, well, most of us can see, right? But on the other one, it doesn't work. Right? Once I know that it's they're horizontal, why can't I force my mind? Um, so, it, we believe that it has to do, there, there are some illusions that you can uh, make yourself see them the right way and others where you can't. And that uh, we think that it has to do with a world level of the hierarchy of information processing that happens in the brain. It is probably the illusions that are closest to the sensory input areas that are less um, flexible to you being able to see them in a way or another, and that uh, because those are likely just hardwired into the neural circuitry, they're part of the circuit, and there's really nothing much that you can do to, to do it in a, uh, to see it in a different way. Illusions that are happening later on in the hierarchy of uh, information processing, they, they may be more flexibility in how they may be influenced by things like attention or expectation. And so if you make yourself attend to different things, you may be able to influence the illusion to some extent. So the three gray ones, where does that feel on that? Did that get resolved? So, so that, that would be more like how it is you know that the corner of that room is going away from you rather than forwards. It's concave and not convex. There's very little information about that on your retina, but you're sussing it out from the shading, the reflections on the floor, the way that the lighting is falling on it and falling on the other things around it, and so therefore how it must be falling. Your brain is figuring out what shape that is, right, based on that kind of information. And so... It's similar, uh, you, may, you may remember the one with the circles versus the rectangles. Many of you just saw rectangles until I pointed out the circles and actually physically showed them to you and then you could 
only then could you see the circles, and in fact, you could uh, just see the circles, and you couldn't do it before, even though I said there were circles there, you couldn't even see it, you couldn't tell. And so when that happens, um, that's more like an ambiguity illusion, right? So there's a bunch of ambiguity, you're, you have primacy in your, in your priority list for seeing things as rectangles and, and, and for, for corners, and it was only after you were forced to see it as a circle that you could then conceive of it as a circle and, and see that amb ambiguous information in that way. Um, so I, th I think it has something to do with that, but the honest truth is that we don't know a lot about how this works. It's why we're still employed studying these things, but we don't know how it works. Going back to the two towers, two-part question. When the two towers first came up, I saw no difference. The one on the right that did not see any further to the right than, than the other. However, when you said you see the one on the right leaning further to the right, I immediately nodded my head. So why was I lying to myself about that? I mean, what, what would have prompted me to agree with what you were saying, even though that's not what I saw? I don't know. So, I was afraid to ask that question for fear, for fear that some pathology I'm about to discover. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I, it could be a number of things. So it could be, um, so one of the ways that this relates to, for example, the, the, the issue of pedophilia and the relationship to the, to the relationship between the, the victims and the abusers, or the parents of the victims and the abusers, has to do with authority and, the, and how authority plays a role psychology. So we know that there are experiments, for example, that have been done in which authority is the fundamental, um, uh, you know, central figure in deciding on how you feel about something or what you're willing to do. So, for example, the, the Miller experiment. Why don't you, why don't you explain this experiment? The, the famous uh, Milgram experiment is an experiment about uh, obedience to authority. And uh, uh, what this consisted of, they uh, basically had a setup in which uh, there was a real experimental subject and a confederate. And, uh, uh, and uh, the real uh, participant was told that the experiment is to figure out what the effects are of um, punishment on learning. So the confederate, they would set up this person with a... Uh, electrodes and wires that uh, gave this person pretend shocks, electrical shocks, and that uh, in the actual participant would recite a list of words that the confederate had to memorize, and they would fail to repeat these words, and they would make a number of mistakes, and every time they made a mistake, the, uh, the, the actual participant would uh, turn a knob and, uh, and apply a shock, and, that, uh, and at first the shocks were very mild, but they kept increasing and that the more mistakes the, the confederate made, the more shocks they had to apply. And, uh, and at some point, the participant actually would say, well, I'm, I'm not comfortable with uh, continuing to do this. This person is clearly suffering. And the experimenter, all that they would say was, please continue, or the experiment must go on. And they wouldn't touch the person, they wouldn't lock them in the room, they wouldn't physically threaten them in any way. They would just say... The experimenter being a person in authority in a white coat standing yeah. in the room saying, the experiment must go on, right? And that uh, anybody would be free to just uh, go up and leave and report it to the police or what have you. And that uh, very few people, I forget the numbers, but uh, as I recall, maybe less than 10% of the people did that, and we're not talking about people who are evil, it could be, it could be any of us. So, the point being that it could be because I have credibility, I'm here to tell you about these things, and I'm telling you what you saw. In that particular case, for whatever reason, the angle you're at, it's on a brown screen, it's from a distance, it's relatively small, you know, that kind of thing. It could be that you didn't quite see that illusion at first, and you were, you know, you wanted to believe, because I'm telling you that that's there, and hopefully you eventually saw it. Not, and none of these are only there because of because we're spoofing. It. They're all these all typically happen. In, in, and and the, typically and, the, and the other thing, I mean, these are also some classical experiments that have been done just about uh, peer pressure, and it doesn't need to be like a very very aggressive 
form of peer pressure, but I, we're, we're all conditioned to some extent about uh, being amenable and being pleasant and being polite. And so if people are clapping, even if we watch a show and we think the show is terrible, but everybody's clapping, we clap too. And I think it may be one of uh, those behaviors. And it may apply also as well to the context of abuse, like if a, if a child sees that, you know, everybody's okay with this situation, it's making me feel bad, but everybody seems to be fine with it, I guess I should be fine with it too. It reminds me of a conversation that we had yesterday where we were driving, we drove from New York City to here with our children who are downstairs in the room right now. And we were just having, you know, reminiscing about uh, the kids were asking why we weren't flying because they have been a long time since they flew in an airplane. And so they wanted to fly to here instead of driving. And, uh, and Susanna brought up how she remembered, do you remember when you were a baby and we'd be sitting on the plane in the runway and the, run, and the plane would start to accelerate to go take off. And it was this pushback in the seat and the kids would immediately do this. They'd look at her because something was happening and they didn't know what. And they wanted to, you know, they're, they're infants now, they're pre-verbal, right? So they're, they're scared and they'd look at mommy to find out what was going on, but mommy, she'd go, whee, right? To, make, to, to keep them from being scared. And what do you think they did? They'd be like, oh, you know, danger without death equals fun. Whee! <laughs> right? So, they, but they were just getting all of this from a, from a nonverbal communication of, of Susanna's face, and she was deceiving them, right? Because she, you know, it actually is a somewhat disconcerting situation that they're being hurtled in. The speed down the runway. So that's a. It's a similar. It's a similar thing. I mean, yeah, yeah, many I think, sources. Of I think that's session. a really uh, important point that children, especially young children, will look up to parents to get their cues about how to react socially to various uh, situations. Yeah, I think that's really important when a, when a child is being abused literally in front of their parents, and it, and it happens. I mean, incredibly often, and uh, you know, for that child. Um, a lot of times there's such a casualness about the child and so we expect that if somebody is in distress they're going to look like they're in distress when the reality is if mom and dad are sitting there while you know while the abuse is going on and the abuser is having a casual conversation with mom and dad and mom and dad are casual back um, that child internally is absolutely mortified terrified and, and shut down but externally they look like us standing here right now. And, and you know, we have the ability to <coughs> compartmentalize and, and just all of us can do it. Um, where on the inside, we can just be in a million pieces, but on the outside, we look put together. You know, we're, we're functioning well. Um, we have good grades. We, you know, we, in every aspect of life, we're functioning well, but internally, we're just a, a disaster. Um, psychologists understand this really well. Um, anyway, uh, do we want to take a little short break? We, we're actually the three of us are going to uh, do an interview uh, with the with the news for a little bit, but we'll make ourselves available at the end of it um, so that if people want to talk to us individually, um, you guys can talk to.